Amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. I want to welcome everybody to our Bible study. Thank you for joining. Um, our pastor is still out and uh, hopefully getting some rest and relaxation, and we want to honor him. Uh, he is certainly um, just one of the best pastors I've had an opportunity to work with. So thank God for Pastor Nathan. Amen. I know many of you are praying for him and his family as they travel. Um, they are, they're doing a good thing. Uh, you have your children at a certain age for only a short amount of time. So it's good to not only spend time with them, but just help them to experience a little bit of God's glorious earth. Amen. Amen. And that's what they're doing. I have a, a word from the Lord tonight, and I'm going to be reading from a passage in Luke. So if you have your Bibles on your lap uh, or nearby or on your phone, um, if you would turn with me to um, Luke chapter number five, Luke chapter number five, we're reading the first 11 verses there for our study tonight. And my subject is going to be deep waters, deep waters. Amen. Reading from Luke five, Luke five. Verses 1 through 11. Here beginneth the reading of God's word. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake Gennesaret, the people were crowding around him and, and listening to the word of God. Verse 2. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by fishermen who were washing their nets nearby. So he got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, who, as you know, is surnamed Peter. And he asked him to put out a little from shore. He sat down and taught the people from the boat. Verse four. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out a little deeper into deep waters and let down your, net, your nets again for a catch. Well, Simon answered and said, Master, we've, we've toiled, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught any fish. But because you say so, I will let down the nets again. Verse six, when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled to their partners on the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. It's a lot of fish. Amen, a lot of fish. Verse eight, when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, go away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man, right? That's just like, it's too much for him to comprehend. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And verse 10, and so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. They were also fishermen. And Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid from now on, you will fish for people. And the King James says, you will be called fishers of men. So they pulled their boats up on shore. They left everything. I want that you to whisper, whisper that to yourself. They left everything and followed him. And so, as I said before, my subject tonight is deep waters, deep waters. And I, if I had a sub, a subtopic, it would be something like, you would have to leave good in order to get to great. Leaving good to get to great. Um, I remember reading a book years ago uh, written by Jim Collins. It was called that, From Good to Great. And that's what uh, came to my mind when I was doing the research for this study. Some, some 27 years ago, a golfer by the name of Tiger Woods exploded on the golf scene and had one of the most incredible first years of any professional golfer. Those of you who were around in 1997, he won the prestigious Masters Tournament by an unheard of 12 strokes. And that year he went on to win four of the 15 tournaments, earning over $1.8 million in prize money and over $60 million in endorsements from Nike and other companies. But he did not stop there. Instead, right after the Masters, he did something that most people would scratch their heads at. He called his coach and he told him that 
he wanted to change his swing. Uh, I'm not a big golfer. I really am not. I, I can hit the ball most of the time, but trust me, I, I have nowhere, no idea of where the ball will end up. But he said to his swing, to his coach, I want to change my swing. And if you talk to golfers, they will tell you that the most important thing in golf is getting your swing right. He said to his coach, my, my swing is not quite right. It's not quite that good. He said, you just won the Masters, my friend. But he said, I want to make improvements. He was willing to risk good, change the most important thing about his game, his swing, in order to get to great. This swing had won him so many tournaments, but he still was willing to risk changing his swing in order to further improve his skill and his results. And he said, his, his quote was, I wanted to be able to control my shots better. That's what he said. His coach was convinced that he could do it. He realized that it wouldn't be easy and it would take some time for him to correct it. So he and his coach worked on hitting hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of practice ball balls as he began to tweak his swing, studied hours of videotapes of his swings. He went into the gym, began lifting more weights. He was especially working on developing his forearm because he believed that that's what it was going to take in order for him to improve uh, his ability to control his shots. While he was reconstructing his swing, he only won one more tournament in the next 19 months. Big step backwards. And I remember this because everybody was exclaiming how he had lost his game. Um, he later did, but that was not the time. But Tiger persisted. And one day it came. The swing that he was seeking, this adjustment that he was making to his swing eventually came to him. And he felt now that his swing was right. He could better control his shots, much better than before, and that will enable him to win more games. So in the next 14 tournaments, Tiger won 10 of them, including six in a row and three of the four major championships, winning him $6 million. And of course, he gained $100 million dollars in endorsements. And this, this was actually recorded in a Time Magazine article uh, in July of 2000. At the time, many people did not know that he had completely revamped his swings because you really can't tell from a distance. And golf game, and his golf game after his first year, who would do this? Why did he make this change? Why did he change a good thing in pursuit of the elusive great thing? The reason is because he wanted to be great. And he knew that he could be great. So here in our story, we have Jesus not being afraid of changing some things, even good things, because there are some other things he wanted to accomplish. Stay with me here for a while. With Jesus, however, he's not interested in winning any, any sports trophies or endorsements. And it's not that he needed to improve himself anyhow, but he was interested in winning people, fishers of men, and, and winning them over to himself. This incident in which Jesus changed from doing one thing to another thing is, is the topic of our, our teaching tonight. Look at what Jesus was already doing. First of all, he was teaching the word of God. That was what he came to earth to do, right? He was teaching a crowd of people and they were listening to him. That's a good thing. He had a captive audience, right? Right off the bank of this, of this river. What more could he ask for? Wasn't this what he was sent to earth to do? To teach people about God and, and the way of salvation? But then he saw something else that attracted his attention. He saw these two boats at the water's edge, two old boats that are typically used for fishing. It's obvious from, from how they are constructed and, and what's in them uh, because 
fishermen often work in two boat teams cooperating together they can catch more fish right these are saw these two fishermen washing their nets that they used to catch a fish and he and he changed what he was doing he changed a fisherman named simon the fisherman named simon we also know him as peter did just that jesus sat down in the boat and continued to teach teach the people from there now jesus was in a different different location than he was before because they had pushed away from the shore he could now address a larger group of people, maybe even more effectively than he could do with the one-on-one -on -one or closer relationship that he was before. He perhaps was able to project his voice more. And since he was facing all of them at the shore edge, perhaps it functioned better acoustically like an amphitheater, right? But I believe there was clearly another reason why Jesus wanted to speak from the boat this way. He wanted later, on to talk to the owner of that boat, Peter. And this observation leads us to this first point I want to make to you about Jesus. He's not only interested in crowds, but he's interested in you. He's interested in individual relationships. And sure, when we go to church and we are in a congregation and he teaches uh, the congregation through the preacher, Yes, that's a general address, but oftentimes the message comes home directly to you, does it not? It, Jesus wants to meet with you. Now, of course, Jesus could relate to the crowds as he had been doing as a, a teacher of many, but he also wanted to relate to this one person named Simon as an individual, one-on-one, -on -one, if you will, mano y mano, tutor. Right. In our in our kids school, teachers are willing to meet with kids, students after school in order to help them with particular lessons that they're having difficulties with, whether it's math or English or science or whatever. These teachers are copying. What Jesus is doing here, not only interested in the larger class of students, but some tutoring, some one on one tutoring with with students who perhaps the teachers see the potential in them. Right. But but perhaps they need a little bit more help. How many of y'all need a little bit more help? I know I do from time to time. And he may do that through something uh, the preacher said on Sunday that relates directly to you in your situation. It, you know, when the word is preached and it. It hits you right there and you feel as though the preacher was listening to your your dinner conversation the night before. God may do that through someone like your small group leader, perhaps, speaking directly to your situation, to your heart, to the situation that you are dealing with at that time. And God may have done that this week when you were praying with your family alone at home, maybe in your quiet time when you were meditating. Uh, remember to listen when you take time to pray. Uh, it's not just you speaking, or even in your silent meditation, it's not just you musing, or maybe you're reading the word of God. This is often when the Lord will drop something into my heart when I'm reading or when I'm studying. So make sure that you are listening when you pray, because it could be that, that God wants some one-on-one -on -one time with you. However, God may connect with you one-on-one. -on -one. Please know that God is always wanting to reach you personally, like he did with Simon in our text. What an astounding thought that Jesus was willing to, to leave the crowds in order to focus on just one person. I always found that interesting, but when you read the scriptures, you always find that Jesus pulling one out of the crowd, uh, whether it was Abraham at the very beginning, who was like, listen, I like you, because you listen to me. Come on, let's go. Right? And he would pull him away and said, leave everybody. Drop everything. Come on, let's go. Uh, why does Jesus approach just one person? Why would Jesus change the focus from the group to an individual? Why would Jesus change from doing a perfectly good thing in pursuit of doing a great thing? Amen. Amen. 
when Jesus met us, in this case, when he met Peter, he took us from, took him rather, from the shallow portions of the seashore to a deeper portion of the water, which is why our text is deeper waters. And so this is my second point. The reason we learn uh, from this passage, as is true to all such times when Jesus, Jesus focuses on the individual, is because Jesus wants to take us from a shallow faith to a deeper faith, from where we are to where he wants us to be. He had been washing, Peter and his buddies were washing their nets while keeping one ear listening to Jesus he had other responsibilities to do. He was going to go fish perhaps the next day. Fishing was his, the way he made his living, right? His family relied on him to bring in a good catch so that they can have enough to eat and perhaps enough to sell. Simon was working hard at his job, like many of you are, in making a living for your family. So I'm sure he may have thought that he could give, couldn't give up what he was doing for for a living for his livelihood just to spend some one-on-one -on -one time with Jesus. But Jesus was going to do something special in his life. And here I wonder if Jesus has been wanting to do something special in your life. But you won't, you won't stop washing your nets. Jesus is trying to get your attention. He's like, let's, let's go to the deep, to the deep waters but you won't stop washing your nets. It could be that the Lord is trying to get your attention. I want you to uh, notice the subtle coaching of Jesus to Peter when Jesus asked Simon to come sit in the boat with me. He also asked him, let's go out into the deep waters a little bit. You see, the Lord will want to separate you from the crowd, isolate you from the distracting influences so that he can pour into your ears, into your heart. Remember, he did the same thing like with many others. You remember Paul? In Galatians chapter number one, we read in verse 15 that God, he was talking, recalling, he said, but when God set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, he pleased him to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles. My immediate response, Paul writes, was not to consult any human being. I did not go up to Jerusalem to talk to Peter and James and the rest of them. He said, I went to Arabia. I later returned to Damascus. But then after three years, God had separated Paul from the crowd for three years for some one-on-one. -on -one. So mano y mano, some tutoring. He said, I went up to Jerusalem after the three years to get acquainted with Cephas and stayed with him 15 days. And then after he had finished teaching the people, he told Simon to go out here into deep waters. This movement from shallow water into deeper water, I take it as an analogy of what Jesus was going to do, not only in Simon's life, but what he wants to do in your life. Jesus was going to take Simon from his superficial, half-hearted, and casual attention way of following him and turn him into a deeper, more personal, and real commitment way of following him. Remember, Simon didn't go willingly. He protested mildly, saying, Master, Master, we have, we've been fishing all night, and we haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I'm going to let down my nets again. That's in verse 5 of our text. In other words... I've already been there and, and nothing happened. But since it's you asking, I'm going to give it one more try. I like that so much because I believe it represents how we sometimes deal with God, even in our useful vocations, our jobs, if you will. God's calling us to do something different, maybe. Or maybe calling us to do what we're doing differently. He pushes us a little bit. And here we see the Lord is pushing him ever so gently, sometimes with words, sometimes with actions, away from one level of comfort or stability as symbolized by the shallow water near the shore 
to a place where we're more dependent on him, symbolized here by the, the deeper water. Uh, and we might we might argue with him saying, Lord, you know, I've already been here and done that. I've already tried fasting. I've already tried reading the Bible through again. I've already prayed today and it hasn't really worked. But hopefully we we won't stop there. We will continue to say, Lord, hey, if this is what you want me to do, I'm going to go one more time. For where I am now, that's not where I want to end up. So so let, so let it be that if you want me to let my nets down again, if you want me to fast another week, if you want me to call my brethren and pray for them another time, I'm happy to do that. Jesus wants to take us from the comfortable shoreline to a deeper place where you will find more food for your soul and more dependence on him. Isn't that beautiful? Now, this can come, for example, in the form of, I don't know, illness or other crisis. Either you or someone you know, all of a sudden, you are drifting away from predictability and one kind of stability to a place that is more mysterious and where you can't see the bottom but God is taking you there. You can't see the forest or the trees. You don't have perfect vision. But just like Abraham, God says, I'm taking you a place where only I know of. My God. And in this case, it may not necessarily be a physical place. It's a spiritual place. God is taking you there. He's not abandoning you. And I know sometimes on this journey, uh, it may feel like you know, you're on your own, that you're abandoned especially in an illness or a crisis. But he's actually using that situation, like a boat, if you will, to take you further out into deeper relationship with him. How many know what I'm talking about? I feel that sometimes or when I feel confused or I feel like um, I don't exactly know where I'm going with a particular thing or a strategy. It may be that God is taking me into a deeper place where uh, I'm I'm not as comfortable, but the learnings that I will experience in going there and when I get there will be better for me and for those with whom I serve. The comforting thing for us to know is that even though we don't know exactly where the boat is going, we know that Jesus is sitting right in the boat with us. To know that the captain of the boat, the captain of the, the universe is with us is also very comforting. Even when we don't know where we are going, we know that the captain does. And by the way, the journey to deeper waters is always, always to help us grow better in God or grow deeper in God. Jesus turns what we are concerned about into what he is concerned about. That's my next point. This leads me to this third point of the illustration. We're always concerned about physical things, but guess what? Jesus is always concerned about spiritual things. Let me give you an example. Dur during the basketball playoffs here in, in Charlotte, I, I, I get a little bit more concerned about the Hornets, right? But Jesus is more concerned about his team, the church. We are concerned about Food, for example, to eat. Jesus is concerned about the, the, the food for hungry souls. Uh, we are concerned about our bills in order to pay so that we're not evicted or there, our car is not repossessed. But Jesus is concerned about the eternal bill we have to pay because of sin. Do you see what I mean? We are concerned about our clothes to wear, but Jesus told us that. Don't be concerned about that. He's concerned about our robes of righteousness to cover our our spiritual nakedness. You see the difference? We as Christians are concerned about our life. Jesus is concerned about the life of those who do not know him yet. We are concerned about our retirement plans, our 401k. Uh, Jesus is concerned about people who will retire without knowing him. He's got spiritual things on his mind not necessarily the practical, physical things that, that we are concerned about. We're concerned about our college kids' bills, our school loans. Jesus is concerned about our college kids' 
spiritual lives, not only on campus if they're away, but when they're back home. We are concerned about fish. Jesus is concerned about men. We are concerned about things. Jesus is concerned about people. And whomever Jesus has encountered with us, and, and whenever it happens, he wants us to be more concerned about spiritual things than physical things. And we can see this again all throughout the scripture. And I'm just giving you a few examples here. And the way that Jesus often reaches us in our, let's call it blindness and busyness in, of life, is to take the physical things that we are so concerned about and tweak it in such a way that it becomes a lesson about spiritual things. He did that all throughout his parables, right? Parables are this, this earthly story with, with a heavenly meaning, right? He takes that which we know and explain that which we don't know about. And he said one time to, to, to those who were listening to him, how can I explain to you all spiritual things if you all can't handle uh, the natural, physical things, earthly things? And then we realize that Jesus is meeting us right in the middle of of our life, and he is making a way so that we can understand spiritual things. Watch this. Jesus takes our health and tweaks it a little bit so that there's some question about our health, and all of a sudden, we have to look at life, not just materially, but spiritually. All of a sudden, we care about everlasting life. J Jesus takes the stable jobs that we have tweaks it a little bit so that there is some question about our work. And all of a sudden, we realize that we need to redefine what we mean by success. Uh, I feel like this is something he does all the time. Jesus takes our stable marriages even, our relationships, and, and just a little turn, just a little tweak of the screw. And all of a sudden, we realize that our relationships take work. And communication and spiritual connection and faith. Jesus takes a stable family, tweaks it a little bit, and all of a sudden we realize that we, we are selfish and we need to become more humble. Listen to him more carefully. In all of these examples, uh, Jesus is taking us from shallow waters to deeper waters. And it is in the deeper waters that we begin to trust God more. We, 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 we don't need to trust God in the shallow water because we can feel the bottom, right? Our toes are in the sands. We're not going to turn over. We know that. If, if things get tricky, we can rush out of the water. Someone says shark. We can get to land quickly. We know that sharks can't survive on land. But in the deeper water, we have to trust God. I hope you're getting this. So, so I want to thank God for deeper waters. And in English, um, in English, we have a saying. We 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 often say, "I'm in deep waters now. I'm in trouble." That's what that means. And the connotation is usually negative. I'm in big trouble. Well, we may be in bigger trouble, but with God leading us to that deeper water, it is an occasion to regain our focus and realize what's most important. Our focus ought to remain on him and where he's taking us. I think that this could be true for our personal lives. Uh, I'd like to grab one example. You, you thought it would be relatively easy, right, to change from a pretty good job that you're very good in and go to a better job, right? So you leave your comfortable job you, know, you want to make more money. You want to be able to work from home. It's a big thing nowadays. The pandemic taught us that we could work from home, right? Whatever the motivation, but some eight years on, after all, you, you had the experience of moving on to different roles previously, and those were comparatively easy. But now it wasn't, it hasn't worked out the way you had planned it at all. It's taken a long time, many years, eight years even, and you're still waiting for this open door. In times like these, the first thing that happens, you start to worry and doubt. 
and be overcome with fear. But I want you to remember that God is leading us. Just like he led Simon on a particular faith lesson, which is designed for you. It's custom made for you. He's taking you into deeper waters where more faith is required. Where we cannot simply rely on our previous experiences, where, where you cannot feel the bottom of the, of the ocean. There's no sand that you can grab your toes and you've got to learn to tread water. There's much more at stake. There's more of the unknown here. But know that he is with you. He has not abandoned you. And there in the deeper water, God is telling us to trust me. As he told Peter, let down your nets again, my friend. And Peter, of course, protests a little bit. But he says, it's because of you. I'm going to do it. But that bigger catch that Peter got will likely mean greater influence for us in our community. That bigger catch is also designed for you individually. Jesus wants us to have a larger faith, broader vision, deeper commitment. Without that, the influence is useless. Jesus always takes the physical, which, which is our interest, and turns it into a matter of spiritual interest. And when we have learned that lesson and learned it well, then God has accomplished his purpose in us. And then we will be ready to be used spiritually for maybe a work that he has called you to do. Maybe like he did Sean and JD, I want you to go to Mali. I want you to go to another country and minister for me. God took fishermen and made them into fishers of men. Like he did with Peter and his friends, uh, like whatever careers we are doing. God will teach us faith lessons. That is the movement from shallow waters into deeper waters. I'm not saying that they all gave up their jobs to become evangelists. Some did. You know, Paul did. And we know Stephen did and others did. But at least there should be the transformation into a deeper spiritual understanding of life. God will take a doctor, save him, and then make him, in, instead of just making him healers of bodies, helping him to heal souls. Like he did with Luke. Luke was a physician. He will take a lawyer like Paul and make him a judge of truth like he did with the Apostle Paul. He will take shepherds and make them shepherds of people instead of shepherds of sheep and goats. He did that with David. Maybe you're a builder of buildings, and God will save you and make you a builder of churches, and maybe a builder of nations, like he did with Solomon. He will take artists and make them communicators of beauty so people could have an opportunity to reflect of the beauty of God. He did that with Bezael, Bezael. He will take students and make them students of his word, like he did with Daniel. He will take administrators and make them administrators of his grace, like he did with Moses, like he did with Joseph. And of course, he will take farmers and make them sowers, sowers of not seeds of uh, plants and food, Sowers of truth, like he did with Amos. And I'm concluding here. Uh, the, the essence of the message is don't be afraid when God's taking you someplace. Uh, don't be afraid when God's turning the screws a little bit, tweaking his strategy with you. It is very likely that God is taking you from a physical comfort zone to a spiritual place where you're you're less comfortable amen but he always has a purpose for you and we don't need to be afraid where we will land i taught last week in another bible study that this the, the antelope is an animal that can 
that can leap 10 feet in the air. And when running, they can leap for 30 feet on the ground. Yet you will go to the zoo and you will see an antelope in an enclosure that only has a three-foot fence. How is that? Well, the antelope has, has a, an internal mechanism that will not allow him to jump or leap if he cannot see where his foot will land. And so you can corral an animal that can jump 30 feet and 10 feet high into a place that has only a three foot fence. And so I'm encouraging you, just, just be comfortable where you are. But when God is getting ready to move you, even though you can't see where your feet will land, God's asking you to jump anyway. Jump anyway. Swim out into deep waters. You say, oh, Brother Don, I can't swim. Let God handle that for you. Let God handle that for you. You, 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 you feel like God has abandoned you, but he hasn't. And when you least expect it, he will say, like he said with Peter later on, step out on the water. And he will prove to you that you can actually walk on water with his help. Amen. I encourage you all to step out into deep waters with God. Amen. That's that's the end of tonight's lesson. That's all I have for you tonight. I hope that this word has been a blessing to you. I pray that God will uh, seal this word to your heart and help you to not just be hearers only, but doers of the word likewise, so that uh, you can encourage somebody and motivate someone, and strengthen someone with this word that I've taught tonight. Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much, Pauline.